Understanding volatility is a key part of being a share investor. So in this video, I want to look at one way of measuring volatility, standard deviation. So here's a quick quote from the credit crisis to get the ball rolling. We're seeing things that were 25 standard deviation moves several days in a row, said a well-known figure trying to explain what was going on back then. Well, in this video, let's just take a quick snapshot here and ask the question, what on earth could a 25 standard deviation event be? And how likely, in fact, is it? So, why are we measuring volatility? Standard deviation is a way of capturing volatility. And basically, we're doing it because, as a share investor, you want to know or try and predict the extent to which shares will go down as well as up. So price movement is an important part of buying shares and price risk is an important part of buying shares. Now, standard deviation won't tell you anything about other risks like liquidity, that's the fact you can't sell sometimes, and or default, that's the issue of going bust, but it will tell you a little bit about price risk. And once again, it's one of those things we are using the past to try and tell you something about what might happen next, and that's not a perfect science. Now then, what is standard deviation? It's essentially a measure of, some people call it dispersion, how spread out numbers are. How spread out from what? Well, in this case, we're looking at how far away numbers are typically from their average value. More about that in just a moment. It's also known by the Greek letter sigma. So if you ever see that on a report or mentioned in the press or anywhere else, that's still referring to the same idea, standard deviation. And here's the calculation. Now, there are a few numbers coming up, but don't panic. This is just an introduction. The numbers are fairly straightforward. And if you don't get them, it's not the end of the world because it's more about interpreting this than actually putting it together as far as uh, most people are concerned. So it's calculated by taking the square root of the variance. A bit more about that in a moment. And the variance is the average of squared differences from the mean. Well, that's a pretty hideous sentence. So let's drop some numbers in and it will hopefully make a bit more sense. So a simple example. First of all, let's get an average. We can't ask ourselves the question, how far is something from an average unless we've got an average? So share price over five days. That's a very simple example, just five days, just five share prices. And you might think, all this effort just to tell me that, well, this is a very small example. What I'm suggesting here can be applied to much bigger examples, much more complex scenarios. So share price over five days, ranging through £1.40 as a starting position, 160, 150, 120, 130. Now, a simple mean, there are different ways to do averages, but a simple mean is the one we want here, is all of those divided by the number of them there are. So add them all up and divide by five, and you get 140. Now, you might be saying, well, I didn't need a rocket scientist to tell me that, but that is where you get the mean from. Now, the question then arises, how far away from the mean are we each day when we look at these share prices? Well, you could do it on a chart. You could say, well, if we start with day one, day one happens to be the mean, 140 pence. 160 pence is 20p over, all right? 150 is 10p over. Then we go 20p below, and then we go 10p below, all right? Now, what we're looking at is what is the average sort of dispersion of those numbers from the mean, which we decided was 140 pence. How are we gonna do that? Well, what we're gonna do is take each difference, square it, and average the result, all right? Because we want the average distance. Now, why are we not just gonna add them up? Because if you add them up, you get nothing at all. Uh, 20 and 30 minus 20 minus 10 is zero. Well, clearly, they're not, there is, it's not, you know, the correct answer isn't zero because there is dispersion here. So just adding them up doesn't tell us very much. So what we're actually gonna do is to take each difference, square it. Now, that's gonna be helpful because we want a positive result. If you're saying, you know, what is the average distance of a typical person's height from five foot 10, the answer is never sort of minus two. It's always a positive number. So dispersion is usually a positive result and by squaring everything, including those negative numbers, will get a positive outcome. Just a bit of maths there. All right, and then we're gonna average the result because we want an average here. So, crunching the numbers for you, Okay, all, we're, all I'm doing is squaring everything, and that turns the negative numbers positive, dividing by five, and the result, once you take the square root, that's called the variance, once you take the square root, is about 14. So the average item is roughly 14.1 pence, 
prices, share prices we're dealing with away from the mean. All right? Is that useful? Coming to that in a moment. Now, purists would say, you're looking at share prices. Surely these five share prices are part of a much bigger uh, population. This is just a little sample. Well, purists would be right. So technically, all right, if you are dealing with a sample that's part of a larger population, just note that you should technically divide by n minus 1. That just solves a mathematical issue with the mean, which isn't perfect in my example. And that would give you more like 15.8, the square root of 250. So not a huge difference, but technically there is a difference there. Now, so what? Most people will be thinking, well, I'm never going to have to do this myself. I would hope someone else might do it for me. So what am I going to take away from this? Well, here's the point. A large standard deviation relative to the mean, for an important caveat there, means the data is more dispersed. All right? And that makes the mean less reliable as a guide to what might happen next. That's the key point we're trying to get to. Whereas a low standard deviation suggests less volatility around the average and therefore a more reliable average number. You can take more confidence, if you like, in the average as a way of forecasting what might happen next. So for example, if you're looking at sort of, you know, something like performance over time of say a fund, okay, a low standard deviation suggests that the average performance you've just looked at might be some sort of reliable guide to what could happen next. And that's where this starts to get more useful. All right, now, we can go a bit further. We can say, I'm not going to go too much further, this is a basic video, we can say that if we have a normally distributed data set, oh, wait a minute, what's that? Most things in life are normally distributed. What I mean by that is they're bunched around the average. You're thinking, no, they're not. Yes, they are. All right. If, let's say, the average snake is three foot long, generally speaking, the next snake you meet will not be two inches or 95 feet. It will be somewhere around three feet. Equally, if the average person's five foot ten, making up these numbers, the next person who walks in the room is probably not going to be two inches high or 27 feet high. You'll tend to get someone who's close to five foot ten. All right, now, you can take that mathematically, that's called a normal distribution, and say most of the data will fall within one standard deviation. I mean, what that means is you can realistically expect, okay, the next event to be roughly 68% of the time, somewhere plus or minus one standard deviation away from the mean. You can expect even more of it to fall within two standard deviations, and you expect virtually all of it to fall within three standard deviations. Now, back to my little sample. What does that actually translate as? It means if you were to start with the mean there, there is the share price one standard deviation above and below, there's two standard deviations above and below, and there's three standard deviations above and below. All right, that's literally just adding or subtracting 14.1 or a multiple of 14 or 15, you know, whichever one of those two numbers you want to take. So basically, that's giving me my spread. What you're basically saying is if you were, try, if you were sort of looking at what you expect to happen next, if you like, you know, something in there, quite likely, something in, in there, very likely, something in there, extremely likely, something up here or down there, frankly, not very likely, almost kind of black swan event territory, if you like. Not saying it can't happen, because that's life, and you can't predict anything um, perfectly, but less likely. So once you get three standard deviations away from the mean, you're talking about relatively unlikely events. And you can imagine, if you're someone who's looking to predict share prices, won't go any further than that, um, this can start to be quite useful in terms of, you know, drawing tram lines about where you expect things to move next. Anyway, I'll leave you with that thought and with this final slide. So let's go back to someone trying to explain the chaos around the credit crunch. All right, let's go back there and just finish with this quote. This was meant to be an explanation. We were seeing things that were 25 standard deviation moves several days in a row. No I don't think we were, all right? That's a headline grabber. It's an attempt to use science to explain something. But frankly, it's not a very likely explanation. University College Dublin reckon that if you want to sort of benchmark that quote against something, a 25 standard deviation event has got roughly the same probability as winning the national lottery 21 or 22 times in a row. So like other bits of financial jargon, Standard deviation is useful, 
that can be used and abused.